piece of legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I call the Honourable James Shaw. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to uh, start my contribution on the Crown Minerals Petroleum Amendment Bill by acknowledging uh, the previous speaker, Barbara Kuriga MP, uh, and her colleague uh, in the Taranaki region, um, uh, uh, Mr Young, who uh, I think have advocated strongly uh, and well uh, for, their, um, for their local uh, um, constituencies uh, and their constituents uh, and the industries uh, that, are, that are represented there. Um, I think, so I'd like to start uh, in that spirit, responding to a question uh, that um, Ms Kuriga raised about what is the future of the, uh, of the energy system? Uh, and I think that there's a number of things that have been conflated here. Um, one is uh, the present uh, and the other is the future, that those two things have, have been conflated. So right now, um, there is uh, a, a problem, and part of it is due uh, to the fact that there is gas infrastructure um, that is damaged, uh, and, and so supply is not getting through. Now, what that demonstrates, actually, is that gas infrastructure isn't always resilient. Um, and so the answer isn't necessarily more gas infrastructure to solve a problem of the existing, uh, of the existing infrastructure. Um, Ms Kuriga is absolutely correct that one new wind farm will not be able to solve our energy requirements in the year 2050. That's right. Over the course of the next 30 years, we need to build a lot more generation, as we have in the last 30 years, and the 30 years before that, and actually in the 30 years before that. Something that we tend to do when there is a requirement for more generation is we build more generation. Uh, and, and so the fact that there is only one new wind farm announced this year is absolutely no indicator that there will be no new generation for the next 30 years, right? There will be plenty of new generation. Yes, as we simplify our fuel supplies towards electricity and away from fossil fuels, that will mean a lot more electricity generation uh, is required. And there is, and there is uh, vast amounts uh, of new energy and new investment uh, going into this field right now. If we were to simplify, if we were to transition our, our car fleet uh, to electric vehicles. Um, the, the easiest way to solve that problem is through the uh, rooftop solar and battery, um, the price of which is coming down enormously. Uh, and so there won't be any additional uh, um, drain on the grid because you'll be actually generating your electricity at the point of use, um, which is uh, at your carport or in your, in your garage at home. Um, we do have an issue in this country due to the unique uh, sort of the pattern that we have where we have this winter um, dip. And it's a, it's a very valid uh, question. What happens during uh, that three-month winter period? Because a battery isn't going to keep us going for, um, for the three-month period. You don't have to use fossil fuels to cover that dip. One of the, I was at an energy conference uh, in Wellington the other day, which Mr Young was also at. One of the um, options that um, was being um, put around there is the idea that actually what you do is you massively overbuild wind Right, so that you've always got that base load, even in, even in the winter, and then the spare capacity in the other nine min months of the year, you use to create hydrogen, which you then export to Japan and other countries that are making a major play in hydrogen, and you turn energy into an export market in New Zealand for the first time. At the moment, we import something like five and a half billion dollars of fossil fuels to cover our energy needs. We import that, and that is almost exactly the same as our balance of payments deficit. We could turn that around. We could actually turn energy into an exporter, um, reverse out our, our balance of payments deficit, and actually turn energy into one of the great wealth creators for this country entirely from renewables. Now, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the next uh, question that was raised is, what about um, uh, the, uh, the idea that um, gas is a transition fuel? I have to say, at the energy it's, conference it's, of... I'm sorry to, to the member, but we are actually speaking to a particular piece of legislation. This isn't a... Um, and just because issues are raised, we're still focused on the third reading of this bill. So if the member would then relate all that back to the bill in front of us, that would be extremely helpful. Well, certainly, Madam uh, Speaker. So, so one of the questions that was r raised in the debate prior to uh, me taking uh, the floor um, was the question of, uh, will this bill um, prevent gas from being used as a transition fuel? And so the question is, well, what, what does that transition look like? So one of the points that we have made a number of times, uh, so many times I've lost count, 
is that we actually, over the course of the next 30 years, still have a huge amount of exploration and extraction of fossil fuels in this country. There are 100,000 square kilometres of existing permits that are being explored for. Onshore exploration is still open. If any of the existing exploration permits come up with a find, then those can turn into new extraction, which is in addition to the current extraction, and that could go out for decades, decades and decades, well beyond 2050, well beyond, I might say, when uh, the world will be wanting it. And so when the National Party says we need to keep exploring on the basis that you know, we need to use this as a transition fuel. If you think about it as a transition, a transition has an end point. And my question to the National Party is, when were you planning to stop exploring and extracting fossil fuels? What year did you have in mind that we were going to stop uh, well, that? Actually, first of all, you're using me and you're bringing the Speaker into the debate. And second of all, I refer you to Speaker's ruling 121, or oh, probably 6, 7, um, where we, the third reading is, is the summary of the, of the bill. Um, we are summarising the bill on the floor of the House, not what another party might do uh, in place of that, but the bill on the floor of the House. And I've given you six minutes, uh, and I really would like you to discuss the third reading of the bill in front of the, in front of the House. Certainly, um, Madam Speaker. My point about uh, gas as no, a transition... Don't argue with me. Would you please comply with what I'm asking of you? My point about um, gas as a transition fuel is that this bill actually starts the transition. It actually says we need to make that transition. It actually gives an incentive to companies to start doing things other than what they were doing last year. Uh, and I have to say, at the, at the energy conference over the course of the last few days, it was extraordinary. The number of proposals that were floating around for liquid biofuels, for new hydrogen exploration, for um, a number of, of different ways that we can solve this um, problem. And, 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 and the point being is that all of those things can come on stream over the course of the next decade or two uh, in order to while we phase out the use of, of fossil fuels, which, which is the whole point of, uh, of this bill. Um, Madam Speaker, uh, I have to say, um, one of the other criticisms that's been levelled uh, at this bill uh, is the idea that New Zealand should be a fast follower rather than a leader. Uh, and I have to say, we are a fast follower. France went first, um, and they actually have gone further uh, than New Zealand. Um, and we are following them fairly quickly, so we are by definition a fast follower. France, France's version of this, France's version of this legislation uh, is to not just phase out exploration, but also to phase out extraction by the year 2040. We've actually put no end date on when extraction would finish. What we're saying is we need to start this transition simply by not looking for more uh, fuel. Madam Speaker, one of the uh, other criticisms that's been levelled at this bill is the idea that it somehow um, does nothing about climate change. And the question has been asked a number of times, do you know uh, how much this is going to change global temperatures? And I can tell you this, 100% of the fossil fuels that you do not burn will not add to global warming. And 100% of the fossil fuels that you do burn will add to global warming. That is, what, that is the nature of fossil fuels. The uh, recent um, IPCC report into where the world was at in relation to our target of holding global warming to 1.5 degrees said that we literally have 10 years to turn this around. And the fastest thing that we need to bring down is fossil fuel use. That's, that, uh, that is what we have to do in the next 10 years. That is a shorter time frame than what this bill envisages uh, Madam Speaker, you cannot, you cannot burn something like 80% of the world's existing reserves of fossil fuels and remain anywhere close to within the temperature goal that we have set of between one and a half and two degrees of global warming. The idea that you want to supplement those existing reserves by going and looking for new reserves when you, when you cannot burn all of the existing reserves, and we know that, it is absurd to, to actually consider that you would say, actually, it's a good idea to go and add to those, uh, add to those reserves on the, on the off chance. 
I have to say, some of the, uh, some of the um, submissions talked a lot about the risk of stranded assets. I'm really worried about the risk of stranded assets because we know that we cannot burn our existing reserves and remain under one and a half to two degrees of global warming. We cannot. What that means is that those assets are already stranded. And the idea of adding to that asset base, right, contributing to it, saying we're going to expand the pool of stranded assets, that is the most economically absurd uh, idea and, and argument that I've, that I've yet heard, uh, Madam Speaker. So I, I have to say uh, that you know, I understand the concerns that have been well represented. I apologise represented to well the member. Your time has expired. Madam Speaker. I'll call Erica Stanford. Madam Speaker, this government's uh, number one environmental and